to go? All right. So thanks, everybody, for showing up to my talk about a uh, non-groovy, non-grails, non, well, to a certain degree, maybe uh, a micronaut topic. But um, this talk is not about technology. And uh, so it's something different than the stuff that you usually get to hear at that conference, which is obviously very technology-centric. Um, I mean, microservices are obviously not the worst idea to model certain systems. Uh, but a question that many teams are, um, come up with is, how do I cut my microservices? How do I model my microservices? I mean, all those technologies, like Grails or Micronaut or Spring Boot or whatever uh, you may want to choose, they are really good on a technical level, but they don't help you uh, with your, I would say, your business modularity. And this is uh, where my talk actually steps in. Um, and uh, my name is Michael Flöd. I come from a company called InnoQ in Germany. You may also want to follow me on Twitter. I'll post the slides or a link to the slides right after the talk. Um, uh, a disclaimer up front, um, I'm not the inventor of domain-driven de design. I'm by no ways as smart as Eric Evans or Vaughn Vernon are. Um, those folks deserve a lot of credit and a lot of uh, respect for their really tremendously uh, important books. And uh, so I just wanted to uh, mention that a lot of those ideas originated from that book. And I just added a couple of my own experiences and stuff like that to this talk. So another and a last disclaimer, none of the stuff that I'm going to present today is a silver bullet. Uh, as my dear friend Jochen uh, tweeted a couple of months or maybe now over a year ago, uh, a good developer should be like a werewolf. Uh, she or he should be afraid of silver bullets. So nor microservices nor domain-driven design are silver bullets by any means. They are good ideas, but you need to apply the tools, or the, the right tools for uh, your job, obviously. Now, in terms of microservices and DDD, there are two things that you often hear about in, I would say, many presentations, many publications. Um, and the one thing is cut your microservices a long bounded context. That's something that you hear very, very regularly from the microservices community. And if you look at, I would say, a lot of the stuff on an implementation level with regards to, main, to domain driven design, um, especially I would say coming from a JDK ish world or something, uh, most folks talk about aggregates, entities, and value objects. But it's not limited to that uh, by, by any means. Um, so, one of the first rules you want to or the first things you want to do with regards to microservices is to align them along your business capabilities. And um, in order to do so, there are tools in domain room design that you help you exactly with that. Um, so there is a chapter in the domain room design books called strategic design, which actually addresses exactly that. How do you model your modules, components, um, your libraries, whatever term you prefer for that, um, along business capabilities. And strategic design offers, I would say, two major constructs for that. The first one is the bounded context, and uh, the other one is the context map with all of its uh, patterns that are a part of that. So those, those small th things down there, we will look into them later on, but they are related to the context map. So, but first of all, I think it's a good idea to take a look at that bounded context. So basically, uh, the bounded context is a, well, a, uh, first of all, a statement that a certain, I would say, business domain or a subdomain consists of several subgroups to a certain degree. So let's say a, if you have a process that uh, processes mortgage loan applications at a bank, uh, you obviously have some, some groups like um, a, a part where the, the people that are interested in getting a loan from the bank fill out all the data, like the, the, the money they earn, 
the, the kinds of loans they want, about the, the property they want to purchase and stuff like that. Then you have some sky kind of internal bank scoring, eventually some external scoring through a credit agency. Uh, you have a decision system for the credits and, uh, and so on and so forth. So you can think about them in terms of the boundary context. And this boundary context um, contains a domain model. So that's your, I would say, your business logic, your business model that resides in there. And the next sentence is, in my eyes, one of the most important sentences in this presentation. The boundary context is the boundary around the meaning of the given model. So it says, uh, it takes into account that you may have, uh, let's say, a term or a word called account. And account, an account can be a bank account, it can be a user account, uh, it can be a savings account, uh, it can be a credit account, and so on and so forth. So depending on the context, we may see things differently. Um, and what we have done, uh, I would say, in the last 15 to 20 couple of years in the, in the industry is we went for a very centralized approach. We, we centralized many things, like with the service-oriented architectures, that was a very centralized model. Like, you had one customer service with one customer model, and everybody had to integrate with that. So, but this approach here, the bounded context, is more or less a, a push towards a decentralization. And that's exactly what we want to do with microservices nowadays. We want to decentralize teams. We want to decentralize functionality. We want to decentralize operations and stuff like that in the microservices world in order to gain a higher velocity. So this idea fits really nicely with it. So let me give you a quick example about you folks at the Great Conf Conference. So, um, you wanted to go to GreatConf, and so there's a GreatConf visitor. Obviously, a technical person wearing a shirt, CD pub, more beer on the Unix shell. Um, and there are three bounded contexts. Let's say the GreatConf organizers organize their software in three bounded contexts. The first context is the reservations. That's where you entered your personal data, your payment data, your invoice data, and stuff like that. Um, that's a perfectly suitable model for this context. It's, it fits. But is it the only customer model that we have? Let's take a look at the other uh, context that we have there, the event management. For instance, with terms with the event management, the organizers want to find out um, which topics are highly popular at the conference or which speakers are very popular in a given market. So they get placed in, in the bigger pl uh, venues or in the bigger rooms of a given conference. Whereas, I would say, niche topics or up-and-coming speakers, they usually start off in smaller rooms uh, where the, the audience uh, doesn't lose themselves. Um, another way of, of looking at the reservations context can be Lunch preferences. So obviously we, we will certainly have uh, people who eat meat, people who follow a vegetarian or a vegan diet at the conference, and we want to reflect that in that conference as well so that the catering fits the needs of, of the customers of the conference. Now, in a centralized way, we would say, ha, those preferences are all part of the customer. They are customer-specific. But is that really the case? I think the best model of a customer in that context is something that you put, um, I would say, if I had a flip chart, I would draw just a couple of lines. One vegetarian, two vegetarians, three vegetarian, one meat eater, two, three meat, uh, two meat eater, three, four, five, six, seven, and so on and so forth. So if you imagine a flip chart and you wouldn't have a computer at your hands, you would just do it manually like that. So those those dashed lines and stuff like that. That's a numeric model. Now, in terms of consistency, let me ask you a question. How consistent will this context up there ever get? It will never be perfectly consistent. Never ever. Because not everybody will fill out their preferences. Some folks won't show up at the conference. Uh, so you, 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 it will always be an estimation. And, but that is, and, and this, this part of the sentence is very important, 
good enough for the given functionality. It doesn't need to be the perfect model. I mean, if there is one dish more or less at the buffet, um, it's like, okay, fair enough, we, we've been pretty good if that's the leftover from the buffet. Um, now, in terms of the badges, so you all got those things there. I see them around your necks, mostly. And um, we need to print them. Uh, and uh, the there, we can work, for instance, with a name, with a job description, and so on. But the thing with the name is now, this name, it can come directly from the reservations. It can come from a centralized customer model. But it doesn't have to. So you can make an educated decision what you want to do with it, if you want to replicate the name, or if you don't want to replicate the name. So basically, the boundary context is the boundary around the meaning of a given model. Now, there is a very good, I would say, slogan in the IT world, the try principle. Like, don't repeat yourself. I would say everyone thinks that this is a good idea, yeah? Don't repeat yourself. Um, I would say that is a perfectly good idea inside of a boundary context. But outside a con boundary context, you may want to explicitly repeat yourself in order to achieve a higher decoupling between business capabilities, in order to gain that higher degree of velocity. So transforming that to microservices, when we say, let's cut our microservices along bounded context, we can take this mantra and say, don't repeat yourself uh, self inside a microservice, but between microservices, you may want to repeat yourself. Now, that's one part. Another part, or I'm always choking a little bit about the microservices community. I always tell folks from that community uh, at the evening at the bar, hey, I would like to hear one microservice talk that doesn't mention bounded context and doesn't, that doesn't mention a re reference to Conway's law. So I've chopped those two things off now. So that's a proper microservice talk now. I did that. Uh, I had the Conway's law reference. Conway's law basically says organizations that uh, tend to build software that communicates like the teams in a communi uh, inside the organization communicate. And this communication aspect is also reflected in domain-driven design, actually. And there is the context map. The context map details how um, bounded contexts may communicate with each other, how th they may talk to each other. And the nice thing about the context map is um, that it doesn't just look at a technical integration, like most folks from the enterprise architecture community do. Like They mostly say, system A is talking to system B. System C is consuming events from system D. Uh, system X talks to system B, and so on. And they draw big, big diagrams for a reason, for a good reason, but that's not all in terms of communication between two systems because we neglect the fact that teams may also communicate with each other. And I would say that the, the context map digs the rabbit hole of system-to-system -system communication or team-to-team -team uh, communication a little bit deeper. Now, in the books, in the DDD books, um, Eric came up with uh, seven patterns for the context map. They are detailed uh, at the left side of that slide. Um, however, I personally think that uh, those patterns are a really good idea, but they are a little bit unstructured and a little bit abstract in the book. So I allowed myself to add a little bit of a categorization for them, upstream patterns, downstream patterns, and in-between patterns. If someone has a better name for the in-between patterns, I'm very happy for feedback, so if you come up with a better name, just tweet me or hit me up at the conference. Um, and um, let me first of all introduce this upstream, downstream, what that means. So basically, we have two systems, a scoring system and a credit agency. So the credit agency is a centralized, I would say, chunk of data uh, that many banks talk to. So 
I'm from Germany, so in Germany we have the Schufa, which is like a big, big credit agency, and it knows a lot about the people in Germany. So how high is the probability that Michael Plöd would pay back his credit? So that's a question a bank can ask, ask them. So the first flow between those two systems that we have is the so-called call flow. So the scoring component is talking to the credit agency. Let's say it's consuming a web service or some restful uh, resource or something like that. That's one flow, and that is the focus of a lot of the enterprise architecture stuff. But there is another flow, and that is called the model flow. So what does that mean, the model flow? Um, basically, um, you have a, the credit agency has a model, a business model. Uh, for instance, it's lookup keys, first name, last name, street, postcode, city, birth date, and that's their lookup key for a given customer. And they answer with a model that contains a percentage value, some warning messages, some knockout criteria, or something like that. I mean, that's their model. But they could also, another credit agency could have an international rating agency model, like uh, AAA, B-, minus, D+, plus, and stuff like that. Um, and this model flows down from the credit agency to the scoring component. And the scoring component needs to deal with that. And this is where the... Um, the focus of the context map is. So basically, um, there is a, an upstream system and a downstream system, and the model flows from the upstream to the downstream system. Uh, it's taken from rivers. So I, I'm from a city called Nuremberg, and we have a river, the Pegnitz, which floats from Nuremberg to Fürth. So the Pegnitz, if I put something in the Pegnitz, it floats to Fürth. Uh, and Nuremberg is upstream, Third is downstream, and so the same connotation is valid uh, for the system-to-system -system communication. And this is where the focus of the context map actually resides, that's the, that model flow. And now there are a couple of patterns uh, in the DDD books, seven of them. I added an eighth one, especially for microservices. Uh, I'll get back to that in a second. So on the upstream side, we have one pattern, which is, I would say, rather straightforward. A given system, let's say you have a Rails application up there which offers some restful resources to you and you can consume them. Or you have an application that offers a SOAP web, web service or something like that. Uh, that's an open host service. Um, and that is mostly used for, I would say, synchronous or uh, I would say orchestrated uh, communication. Um, however, there is also um, Another uh, way of collaborating with microservices, and that is event-based communication. So I added an eighth pattern to that, which is the event publisher. That's my, my personal idea, that where I think this is a good idea to have in there as well as a pattern. When some system just publishes out domain events and says, hey, I've scored an application, I've declined a credit application, Someone has submitted a new credit application and stuff like that. And others react on that. So if you, if you want to go for choreography as an integration style, that pattern might come in handy. Now, that's the upstream side. Now let's take a look at the downstream side. On the downstream side, we have uh, three patterns in the DDD books. And uh, it starts off with the customer supplier. Uh, and this is a, a, a very good and a very clear example why the context map digs deeper than just looking at call flows. With the uh, customer supplier relationship, the, um, the, the downstream system's team takes influence on the interface of the upstream system. Maybe, I, I think most of us, uh, if, I, if I look around here, uh, I see a couple of uh, folks that already worked, I think, a couple of years in the IT industry. Uh, and I think all of us have spent quite a bit of time in uh, interface meetings where we discussed interfaces with some providers or stuff like that. Yeah, And the downstream team can say, hey, I need that field, I need that field, and can you add me that functionality? And the upstream team says, yes, that's a good idea, I'll do that. Thanks for the input. Or another case, the upstream team wants to change the model a little bit. 
So they want to move a little bit stuff from the interface, they want to remove stuff, and suddenly the downstream team starts an escalation to the senior management and tells them, hey, we don't have any budget, we don't have any capacity in terms of people to do that. You can't do that. And they get through with it. So they have a, a, a implicit veto right on the upstream team's model. So they take an organizational influence on that. And this is basically the customer-supplier relationship. On the other hand, the conformist, the conformist is a pattern that, um, where the upstream, downstream team just consumes whatever they can get from the upstream team. So it's basically a pattern where um, they, they just roll with the model from the upstream system. They just take it in and work with that. That can happen on a, I would say, mandatory basis. If you have a company-wide model that everyone has to comply with, in German, we say the Unternehmensdatenmodell, uh, the company data model, which is a horrible thing if you want to decentralize stuff. Um, but it comes from a very centralized world. Um, and uh, then you are a conformist. Or you think, hey, the stuff from the upstream team is exactly my view of the world. That's exactly how I see those things as well. And I just comply with it. Good for you. And the third option that you have in there is uh, the anti-corruption layer. If you would move that from an upfront design perspective, a greenfield approach, that would be your preferred way of dealing with things here uh, in terms of those models. So uh, the, the anti-corruption layer takes in an external model and transforms it to an, a new my own worldview. Let's say I get a customer from a customer service, but I really don't care about customers. I care about addresses or address stickers. And I just transform the customer to an address sticker in my own context. That's the anti-corruption layer. What is very important to me here is that the anti-corruption layer is, in fact, a, a semantic translation, also on a language level. So if you just take in a technical... Uh, let's say, model from a WSDL file and transfer that DTO to your own business model, but the same attributes, the same functionality, the same semantics uh, apply, I think you're still a conformist. That's not an anti-corruption layer. I would want to transform it to something totally different or to, to something that's different to a certain degree there. Now, those are the things that uh, you can have on the, um, on the downstream side. Um, there are, however, a couple of things that can be in the middle, between both. And um, the first one is the shared kernel. Uh, who in the room has ever implemented an RMI communication between two systems, or a hashy and burlap communication with a binary protocol? Yeah, a couple of folks. So what do you need to do? You need to share a jar file between those systems. So, and that jar file, for instance, is your shared, shared kernel. Uh, if there's functionality in it, you need to be binary compati comp compatible between the two with that jar file. Um, that's one option for a shared kernel. Another option for the shared kernel is your centralized database. And that's like the, the, the monolith kind of thing where uh, if, you, if you look at badly designed monoliths, uh, you will realize that most of them have one big, big database, like the huge Oracle DB2 kind of stuff, and there is tons of table in it, and everyone, every business model you, that you have may select or join Chris and Cross throughout that database. So you have like big, big joins and stuff like that. So in the end, that database becomes your shared kernel. And haven't you seen that quite regularly, that exactly that construct is a thing that is a big blocker when you want to move fast with your application? Because you change something in there and half of your code base breaks suddenly. Or uh, errors cascade and stuff like that. So that's a shared kernel. Um, now, in terms of, I would say, our, our first guess is the shared kernel is a bad thing. Right? Um, I would say, I would answer that question with the standard, uh, or the best answer any software architect can ever give. It depends. 
uh, and it depends on organizational th aspects. Now, let's say you have one team, and that team is responsible for three microservices. Now, I mean, those microservices will be tied very closely together because it's just one team managing them. So they are just managing the shared kernel. So I would say the shared kernel isn't, well, it wouldn't be a perfect choice. Yeah, I, I would say, hmm, a little bit, hmm, not, not, not the best idea, but yeah, if it suits your needs, go with that. Now, another scenario, you have two teams from two different vendors working on software and they are both competing at your organization for your bigger budgets. And your IT procurement team has given each of those teams a really tough fixed price deal. Now guess what happens to the shared kernel? It will, it will turn toxic on you. And I mean absolutely toxic. It's your nuclear waste plant uh, that you have there. Uh, you don't want to have that in that scenario. So the first scenario, organizational-wise, the shared kernel is, well, not the best idea. Otherwise, it's like the worst idea possible. So please be aware of organizational uh, considerations there. The next pattern is one that I love. And I think that is a really good idea if you want to create very decoupled microservices. It's the published language. You describe things in a glossary. And every team, um, has to stick to the rules in the glossary, but they have a freedom how to implement it on their own. Um, who knows the ISBN number for books? Yeah, quite a few folks. So every book has an ISBN number. That's a number that's a global identifier for a given book. And if you look at uh, Wikipedia for the ISBN number, you find a perfectly example for a published language. So there is like a, a 30 digit pin, a registration group, uh, a publisher code, a title code, and some checksums. So every microservice that integrates with that has a freedom of choice in how far they want to implement the ISBN number. Some just can handle it with a string, they just pass it through, and that's good enough for them. And I always say software architecture is most of the time being good enough for your requirements. Uh, another team needs to work with the checksum. Another team needs to work with the publisher and title codes uh, for that because they want to do some logic on that. And every team has a freedom of choice how far they will go with the implementation of that. But the terms and the rules are the same for every team. You don't have a shared library for the shared kernel, uh, for the published language. It's just a glossary a Wikipedia entry or something like that in your wiki. Now, the next thing is separate ways. So basically, I would say when two things don't have anything in common, it's not of interest. When they, two contexts don't talk to each other, there's no interest. Uh, that's, that's true. But uh, what I often see in call center applications, for instance, is a, uh, that there are two applications, and the folks in the call center copy-paste data from one application to the other. That's often called an organizational fix. Um, and uh, I want to know about that, if that's happening. Because if you don't consider that in a transformation, you may run into real trouble. So that's the patterns here. And I'll give you a quick example. So what I do when I draw context maps, I first of all add upstream, downstream, uh, then I look for open host services and event publishers, for instance, and then I look at the downstream side, how they are being consumed. So that we have a conformist on the scoring level, a conformist between customer and the credit application. We have a shared kernel between um, scoring and the credit application and an anti-corruption layer by consuming that event. Now, the interesting thing here lies over there. Take a look how the model of the credit agency may propagate through the conformist in scoring and the shared kernel down to the credit application. That's a risk that you have. So, because scoring is running completely on the model of the credit agency, the model of the credit agency lives in there as well. And since they have a shared kernel, there's a risk that part of the model of the credit agency might pop up in the credit application. Haven't you had that in a couple of refactorings? Oh, we changed something over there, and suddenly over there, the door fell off. 
And that's exactly that cascading effect that you have. And it's also a good fit for Conway's law. So some of the patterns call for tight coupling and integration. Others go for a rather, I would say, loose independence between teams. Now, um, another thing, microservice architectures should be evolvable. Now, this is where the technical design part comes into play. Um, I won't go, uh, I will go over that stuff rather quickly, to be honest. Um, it's a way of implementing things. DDD knows about aggregates, entities, value objects. So basically, entities have their own constant identifier, they have their own life cycle, and stuff like that. Value objects are rather derived by their values. So let's say this presenter costs 60 euros, so we have 60 and euro as a monetary amount. We don't care which 60 euros those are I'm paying that thing with. It's just 60 euros or something like that. And those two can be grouped together. Um, now, no, sorry, one thing. Did you realize the bug on my slides? Customer, 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 on both. Now, what is the customer? Is it an entity or a value object? It depends on the context. In one context, the customer may be an entity. In another context, the customer may be a value object. And we can group both of those together with the aggregate. Um, the aggregate is a very powerful construct uh, which groups together entities and value objects. So we, we more or less go, go ahead and group parts of our application together there. So, and there is one new thing, the root entity. Did you see that? The root entity over there, this one. That's like the life cycle override inside the aggregate. And that's also the only allowed entrance point into uh, an aggregate that you have. And um, in terms of best practices for the aggregate, keep them small, um, reference them by identity. So I don't want to have get customer in my loan application form. I just want to have a get customer number. I just want to reference to the identity and not directly because I want to decouple things. And I would also treat them as a consistency boundary. Uh, stuff that needs to be really consistent should be inside an aggregate. Stuff that can be eventually consistent or with a delayed consistency can be placed outside the aggregate into a different thing. So you should also have one transaction per aggregate and not a big, big transaction uh, for like what you do usually do in monoliths. Now, here's a quick example. Uh, we have four aggregates. In terms of decoupling, what we can do, you, you don't have to hook them together directly. You could, for instance, go ahead and create dedicated value objects that hook aggregates together. So now with the person ID and application number and stuff like that, if you look at my GitHub uh, presence, um, there is a project called DDD with Spring that implements those aggregates. So if you want to dig deep into the code, you may want to check that out as well. And um, so a couple of implementation hints. Public and private are not your only visibility operators that we have. We, have, we also have a very handy thing called package visibility. So maybe you want to work with package visibility and um, prefer aggregate, putting aggregates into certain packages and uh, work with those value object uh, references between them. Um, now, another thing that I want to have is I don't want to see any framework stuff in my aggregates. I don't want to have any Grails stuff in there. I don't want to have any Spring stuff in there. Keep them plain Groovy or plain Java or plain whatever where you have no technologies, no frameworks in there. They should really reflect your, your business core, your business stuff. Now, we can put that into something that is often referred to as an hexagonal architecture. That is a very, uh, I would say, popular approach to dealing with, uh, to implementing things. That we have some input adapters that accept calls over restful resources that consume events and stuff like that. Then we have application services that orchestrate calls to, uh, I would say, databases, aggregates, and so on. But this model is not the only one that we have. 
Um, I would say that's the hexagonal model that is very suitable for code bases that need to implement, or for contexts that need to implement a lot of business logic where you do a lot of calculation, a lot of rules and stuff like that. But not every microservice or not every boundary context is like that. Some are just CRUD trim, where you just pump in some data, you do create, read, update, delete, and that's good enough for that context. Don't make your life more complicated by implementing the full-fledged hexagonal architecture by that. I would say a perfect technological fit for a CRUD-based microservice is the complete Grail stack. I mean, it's just super suitable for that. If you just have a couple of tables with the scaffolding and, and, and stuff, and you can add a couple of bells and whistles to it uh, with the event system and so on, that fits perfectly. Or you have other microservices, or maybe you remember in your code base where you have pieces of functionality that are driven by queries, where like most of the brain power has been invested and the most sophisticated possible queries to data storages for analysis and, and stuff and reporting and stuff. So think about that as well. One, one slogan the DDD community always comes up with is the domain should be the heart of your system. So if your domain is just query driven, please implement it query driven. Throw away the aggregates. Doesn't make sense to do that in there. If your domain is logical, business logic driven, calculation driven, and so on, then the hexagonal architecture with the aggregates will be a very powerful and a very helpful tool. Just choose the right tool for your job. Now, there are a couple of integration styles. I mentioned a few of those already. So I talked about orchestrations versus choreography. And um, I want to focus on the choreography because that's the fancy stuff right now. I mean, we heard reactive here and there in the agenda. Event-driven microservices are the hot stuff right now. Um, so there we have an credit application submitted event and other contexts are subscribing to that event. They are consuming, they are doing stuff based on that thing. And domain events are a very hot topic right now in the DDD community. So you have workshop moderation models like event storming, for instance, uh, that focus on an analysis based on domain events. And um, this is, I would say, in the, in the last, if you look at conferences from the DDD community, you see a lot of talking about events. And they, they are a very popular thing for implementing event-driven microservices. So domain events model activity as a series of discrete events. And an event is always something that happened in the past, and it can be triggered, for instance, by user actions, by applications, by time, or by documents, for instance. So if someone sends in a signed contract to your organization, that document triggers an event. If there is a grace period running off, that's an event on an offer, for instance. So those can be uh, triggers for events or other events. Um, I want to mention one thing. Now, what I see very often nowadays in the microservice community, it's all about Kafka. Apache Kafka here, Apache Kafka there, and so on. And recently I read a, a tweet that said, the solution, Kafka, the problem, you tell me. So um, I, I really like that tweet. Let me give you a different flavor for the implementation of events. I just want to tease that. Who knows Atom or RSS? Yeah, good stuff. If you combine that idea with RESTful resources and domain events, you can create event feeds where other microservices are pulling against. I mean, Kafka is a really powerful technology. I mean, it can scale up to whatever, I don't know. Uh, but does every team really need a dedicated message broker or a broker in the middle? Or, I mean, yes, I know Kafka is more a distributed commit log than a broker, but it's often being used as a broker. No, you don't need that. You can, for instance, have one application publishing an Atom feed with events, and another application just pulls that. That is good enough for many teams, for many situations, especially if you're working in a hybrid cloud scenario. 
So let's say you have an on-premise cloud, let's say an on-premise Cloud Foundry stuff, and you have a public cloud on AWS, Azure, or whatever provider you prefer, uh, where do you place the Kafka? How do you handle firewall rules? Yeah, I mean, opening an HTTP firewall port is often a rather straightforward thing. Opening dedicated firewall ports on proprietary for proprietary software may be a little bit tougher. But in order to offer those feeds, we have to persist our domain events. And this is where a thing called event sourcing uh, comes into play. So basically, event sourcing is an architectural pattern where we just store away our events, mostly in an append fashion. New event, new event, new event, new event, new event, and we save them to a database or something. So you can, for instance, use a relational data store as an event store. You can use Cassandra for that. Some folks use Kafka for, uh, for that. So Confluent is also publishing a couple of blogs where they say Kafka is a good idea uh, for an event store. Others use a dedicated event store like the Axon event store, for instance. That's a possibility. But now querying against those event stores is a tough thing. I mean, you need to rerun all the events in order to have a projection of your data. So there is another pattern that's very popular uh, nowadays, and that's called CQRS, Command Query Responsibility Segregation. We go ahead and build up a read model based on that event, and we send our queries against that uh, specific um, read model. Um, very interesting thing, solves certain problems really well, but I don't think it's suitable for every situation. So just choose, choose it for the right use cases. Also, if you want to create, you can use it on a larger scale, but uh, where I actually use that stuff quite often is when I want to work with projections, with queries that span various aggregates. So I create a context internal view model over a couple of aggregates so that I, I don't have to, to couple them very tightly together. Uh, good idea. Now, if you want to migrate um, to um, microservices from a monolith, you often have a starting point, and your monolith, uh, well, or I would say, some monoliths look from the outside like that, yeah, and they keep their promise from the inside. Yeah, it's a little bit old, uh, but it looks sort of structured, but other monoliths, when you take a closer look to the inside, they look not so structured. So uh, in, in that way, I would actually go ahead and work two ways. Top down, you can work with context maps, and bottom up, you can work with stabilizing through aggregates. And if you do that in an iterative manner, you get out a couple of microservice candidates. Now, I think the top-down approach is really suitable for monoliths that are quite well structured, for instance. So, for instance, in Grails we have the, the plugin system, don't we? We can use that for technical stuff, but you can also easily create business plugins for that. Uh, I think it was last year where I showed event-driven uh, applications with the Grails stack. And there's the internal event system in Grails, which is amazing. So you can work event-driven across different plugins that are business-based. And in such a thing, I would first of all start with a context map, identify candidates, and extract stuff out to, to newer things. If you have a totally messed up monolith with like references going left, right, left, right, left, right, I think the bottom-up approach is a good idea, where you stabilize first by introducing aggregates to it, and then based on the aggregates, I would go ahead and uh, identify bounded contexts, isolate them even further, and then extract microservices out of those. But one thing that is very important to me, please never ever do yourselves and your career the favor and never do a big bang migration of those things. I've never seen that working, never. It always fails. And what I prefer is take baby steps. And each step of the migration should be an improvement. So if you get a budget cut, for instance, you're still better off than we, you were before. The worst thing is with those Big Bang migrations is 
that you, um, you start off and you start building tactical solutions, so intermediary solutions, and then you have a budget cut and you're off with a system that's worse than the, than the, the one you had before of that. Right, to close that off, one final remark. I'm currently writing a book. I'm writing way slower than I expected to do, but I'm constantly writing on it. Uh, and it's uh, a practical domain-driven design book based on a case study. And it's actually a quite a big case study and I discuss various aspects on, uh, on domain-driven design. So if you're interested in that, you may want to check it out on LeanPub. And yeah, I think we have time for a couple of questions. Any questions? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I would say um, the it, you should invest a bit of an effort to make sure that the aggregate really is a consistency boundary. And I would take that very serious because the, the, the nice thing about the aggregate is that if you have that in place and I if you were strict on that, you can easily evolve later on by pulling out two aggregates or one aggregate into a new bounded context, into a new microservice. And if you have the consistency boundary and the transactional boundary around those, uh, it's way easier than pulling them out of really big transactions that are used other, otherwhere as well. But of course, there are certain ways where you need to break the rules. I mean, no doubt about that. But um, I would only break the rules for a really good reason, and I, would, I should know why I'm doing that, and I, I would highly suggest that you document the breaking of the rules and make the contract clear there. Mm -hmm. um, well, um, if you if you do that, um, if you have, let's say, one big operation in a web that would then span two transactions, let's say one mouse click on a web application, that would go over two or three aggregates, and it would be a big thing. Um, yes, then you would have three transactions, and then you have to work with compensations, but. If that happens very often, I would really question if my aggregates are cut properly. If, 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 uh, I mean, the consistency boundary is one on the one side on the technical level with the transactions, on the other side also on the business model. If you have stuff that always happens together and that has to happen together, maybe you want to go for a bigger aggregate then. All right, so I would say within the next 30 to 60 minutes, I'll publish uh, the link to the slides on my Twitter account. Uh, make sure to check them out if you're interested in any other things. I'm around at the conference today. Uh, we'll leave tonight. Uh, so if you have any further questions, just walk up to me. And I thank you all for sticking out with me and for listening. Thanks.